brethren uh, always enjoy being able to visit, but I always miss being here. I miss uh, seeing you and uh, also being here at home with you. I, I hope the feeling's mutual. If it's not, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you didn't tell me, but I, I, it, is, uh, it is just good to be back tonight. One announcement that I want to make uh, aware of everybody, I tell everybody, we did swap over with our internet stuff a little bit here in the building. We've had a lot of internet problems uh, the past several months, but we swapped over, and if you're trying to get online with your phone, and if your Bible has an app, or if your phone has an app, if your Bible has an app, that's really impressive. But if your phone has an app and that's how you use your Bible, um, it is the Little On AP. Uh, that is the internet service that we have, Little On AP. And the password for that is the phone number, 2567673170. Uh, I have a, an app on my phone that I use uh, that uses the internet uh, for a part of my Bible. And you may have that. That is the password for that. And you should have full service. Uh, all throughout the building, even in the activity building right now with it. So it should be working well. And, and I hope that that's a, a way that we can help you. I hope it's not a way to keep you distracted, maybe playing Doodle Jump or Fruit Ninja or something like that during service. Uh, but uh, I hope that it's able to help you in your efforts to try to learn more. Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 19. We've been looking at works of the flesh versus the fruits of the Spirit. And how Paul has is, is given us the concept that we're at war. And if we're at war, we're at war with the matters of our, our flesh and our spirit. So let's look at the specifics. These are the things we struggle with in the flesh. And when we remove them, there are things that correspond to them or the opposite of them on the other side of the fruit of the spirit. So if we remove these things from the flesh out of our lives, we're able to put something in that hole to fill it from the fruits of the spirit. We looked at adultery, fornication, and cleanliness, lasciviousness several weeks ago. Uh, if we remove those things out of our life, that sexual around, those sexual sins, we fill it with true love. That's what the first fruit of the Spirit is. Uh, we looked at after that. We looked uh, in Galatians 5.19. You'll we'll, we'll look at the other uh, idolatry and sorcery. We're the next two uh, in the group of sins that were listed there are works of the flesh. Idolatry, serving other gods, and that's sorcery. We even looked at how that has to do with the use of illicit drugs, because the word for that is pharmaceuticals, where we get pharmaceuticals. And it has to do with uh, using drugs for specific purposes that are not what they're supposed to be used for. And, and how if we remove that out of our life, because people look for joy and peace in those things, but they don't find it. True joy and peace only comes in the spirit. And then we looked at joy and peace, how that uh, portrays in that. This next group of sins that are listed, there's about eight of the works of the flesh here that we're going to be discussing. We're only going to do three of them tonight. But they progress. They start off with thoughts or, or feelings and or attitudes, and they build from these feelings, attitudes into actions. And these eight that we're going to be discussing before we get on the next fruit of the Spirit to fill in, uh, and I think you'll see why when we get there. So let's just look at our Bibles and let's look at those works of the flesh again. And then let's cover these three that are mentioned. Verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, and jealousy. Now, as we, we finish the rest of the group here, uh, Go ahead and look at the end of verse 21. I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if it's another thing to warn us to say, if you're involved in these things, you're not going to go to heaven. It's worthy of us looking at them and finding out what they mean. And if you're like me, a lot of these that you get to in the middle of the works of the flesh, the words, they kind of get a little confusing. And you don't know exactly what they mean, what they are. Well, that's what we're here for. That's what we're going to be doing. These three that we're going to be talking about are enmity, strife, and jealousy. And you may think you understand some of them, and you may understand all of them. But just bear with us as we look at these three. The, word, the first one we're going to look at is enmity. The Greek word for that means hostility or hatred. Right? It describes a state or attitude of mind toward people which involves barriers between you and me and draws a sword. So if I have enmity with you, 
is I have this feeling of hatred towards you, and I'm willing to go to blows with it. I'm willing to fight over this hostility that we have for one another. It, it may be an anger. You'll see how this attitude develops into actions, and you'll see the fits of anger, murder, and all that that's listed after this in these works of the flesh. So this means, this, this enmity means, it's a feeling of a hatred or a hostility that I might have with someone, that you might have with someone, that you're willing to draw the sword over, that you're willing to go to blows with, okay? It, 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 it's a strong feeling. Now, other versions may have different words there, but strive usually is the one that's, that's our enmity, the, the one that's mentioned the most. And if you look at antonyms, you know, the direct opposite of the word, this is the direct opposite of agape. That is the direct opposite of what it means to have that love, that unconditional love, is to have this strife, this hatred, this hostility. Look at these passages with me here. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, in the reading that Marty did just a second ago. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Let's look at that again. 3, 13 through 15. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. There's going to be that hostility between us and the world. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love, brother, love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother, that word hates there, would be the same word that's used as this strong, this enmity is a murderer. So it's putting the same context of this word of going to blows or going sword or going to fight with this hostility, it's a feuding type that leads on to other actions. The same attitude that as of a murder. It's intense will, I'm sorry, intense ill will, wishing evil upon another. So it might be that I've got a problem with you over something, I'm willing to fight about it, but I'm also willing to, boy, I wish that person just fall off the bridge. I wish, that, I wish the worst for that person. If you've ever had feelings of that, that's what this enmity means. That's what the enmity means. Um, while you're in first John, look at chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. It's probably on the next page of your Bible there. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he cannot see. For he who does not love his brother whom he, can, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment, we have from him whoever loves God must also love his brother. So it lets us know that we need to be, we need to have that agape love toward each other. We need to strive for that agape love. We need to make sure we don't have this enmity towards one another. And whatever might be coming between you and your brethren uh, that's causing you this fight, you address it quickly before it progresses into something else. Which the next one would be strife. Enmity, strife. The Greek word for that is eris, E-R-I-S, and it means squalling, quarrelsome, or argumentative. And it's, it's translated in other versions as variance, or a contentious temper. Some of the modern versions would read that as a contentious temper. Others have said it's a disposition to wrangle or quarrel. So this is, you, you have this feeling of ill will towards somebody, but with, with strife, you're willing to argue with them as best you can, and your purpose for arguing with them is not to prove your point, but to demolish theirs. Okay? It's to demolish their point of view. I remember when I was, when I was very young, I had a friend of mine who claimed to be an atheist, and I remember wanting to talk to him and, and trying to convert him. But the way I did it was so wrong. Because I took my Barfield notebook that I had and I opened it up to all the things that were right and, and true and faith-based. And I just hit him with all this stuff. And my, my purpose was not to convert a soul. My purpose was to destroy his heart. That's what it was. It was not to win an individual over. It was to destroy his argument. And in doing so, I probably, probably fixed it to where this individual will never obey the gospel. He still is not obey the gospel. We're friends. We talk. We're cordial. But 
We haven't spoken about faith in several years. Probably won't. He, he, he doesn't want to listen to me because of the attitude that I have when I went in to begin with. This kind of strife, this kind of feeling that we have, it's, it's an argumentative thing. You know those people that just like to argue. Just for the sake of argument. And it's not that they're trying to prove a point, but rather they're trying to demolish yours. And it builds from this other word, enmity. It builds from the great word for enmity. And it adds on to that. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. And you'll see. Going into Proverbs. Chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife. That feeling, that enmity that you might have, it stirs up strife. But love covers all offenses. They're the opposite of that being love again. The arguments, the, the hostility of enmity pushes us toward these contentions and wanting to argue about things. All the more problems. It's the same problems that they were having before it. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and then you skip on over to chapter 3, verse 3. It's the arguments that they're having of, well, I'm a Paulus, or I'm a Paul, and I'm, I'm a Christ. And that the arguments of, of how they were dividing the church and saying, well, I was baptized by this guy, and I was baptized by this guy. Oh, well, I'm better than you because I was baptized over here by this person who's closer to Jesus. And those types of arguments that they had, they were going through it with this hatred and strife, trying to prove the other wrong. Romans 129 says this is the kind of life that we were called out of. This is the pagan lifestyle. This is what the pagans do. The pagans have these kinds of feelings of strife toward one another. That's not supposed to be found in the life of a Christian. But I think all of us maybe have had those feelings before. Having those feelings when I get to that. Enmity. Strife. And the last one here, jealousy. Jealousy, the Greek word for that is zealous. And it's translated in some versions as emulations. Some of your Bibles may have that mentioned there. It's often associated with strife. It's put in the same, a lot of the same verses that talk about strife include jealousy with that. If you're going to have these, uh, these feelings of arguments, you're going to be argumentative about it to destroy others' opinions. Once you do that, you're going to have this jealousy. The jealousy that begins as that small root that continues to grow deeper and deeper. It's a competitive spirit. One commentator puts it, a competitive spirit that's gone awry. It's a one-upmanship. That's what it is. A one-upmanship. It's, it's not just the jealousy that this is what I, I want what you have. It's not like a coveting type thing. It's a, I want to be better than you. And I want to try whatever I can to one-up you in whatever situation that we may be discussing or we may be dealing with. If we have this jealousy, that's also not the kind of lifestyle we need to do. If you look at Proverbs chapter 6, go back to Proverbs and look. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 34, it, it promotes a vengeance. It promotes uh, other problems. Proverbs 6, Verse 34, jealousy makes a man furious and he will not spare when he takes his revenge. So if you look back here in this, these works of the flesh, and if you look at what happens here with these feelings, these emotions that we start, emulation, strife, jealousy, which leads to fits of anger, revelries, dissensions, divisions. These are the emotions and the feelings that we get that over whatever the situation may be. And if we let them develop and stay in our lives, these attitudes grow into actions. And the actions are what have serious consequences. Now don't get me wrong. The attitudes have serious consequences as well. The attitudes will keep you out of heaven just as much as the actions will. Just because you can be angry and sin not. You can have these, you can be somewhat upset with the person. 
You can have a disagreement with the person, but you don't need to be the one of, I want bad things to happen to this person. I'm ready to fight with this person over this. I am so jealous of this person. I want to be so much better than them. You don't have to have these types of feelings, but the consequences, you may have these emotions, and you may get by with the consequences, but if they lead to actions, that's when the consequences really come in. That's when you see people that are on the news. That's when you see people that snap and, and they have these uh, we have these mass shootings that we've had all over the place. All over the place. It's going to be terrorist attacks. They have these same types of feelings. They bring people to do this. When you look at the, this jealousy, look at the first Corinthians chapter 13, the, the chapter of love. And of course, love cures all, but when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it talks about love. What it says here in verse 5. 4 and 5. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not arrogant or resentful. And it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. But it rejoices in the truth. These are the kinds of things that if we have in our life, lead us into some serious problems. Now, when we look at these first group of works of the flesh, you may not have trouble with adultery or fornication. You may not even have trouble with idolatry. You may not have trouble with this sorcery. But now we're getting to the nitty-gritty of things that a lot of us deal with on a daily basis. Now we're getting into those emotions that we don't really want people to know that we feel for others. There are those of you here that have feelings of, of enmity toward others. You have feelings of, of strife or you're, you're ready to argue and squabble and wrestle with things. Some of you may even have these feelings of just jealousy. You just want to warn up others. You're jealous over what a person has, so you're going to try to keep up with the Joneses and just one up or one upmanship, uh, a nice competitive nature that's gone wrong. But these things are serious feelings that we need to deal with. How do we deal with them? The fruits of the Spirit. Namely, that love that we've mentioned, peace, and joy. Patience. That's the one that we'll be focusing on when we get to it. The patience. Learning how to, to live patient lives so that we don't have these feelings on a regular basis. So that's it for tonight. For our lessons that we look at, these feelings, let's make sure we put them out of our life. Let's make sure we don't deal with them. Let's make sure we look at living lives of love, living lives that are going to be patient with others, and try to overcome these feelings before they get to actions that get us in trouble. Tonight, if you're a member of the body of Christ and you've had some of these issues, you need to respond. You need to respond publicly so that we can help you. Publicly so that we can all pray for you and, and, and even uh, be there as a, as a person of support or accountability to help you with that endeavor. But if you have something in your life that's private and you want to take care of it in a private nature with you and God, that's fine as well. The point is that you just address it as fast as you can so it doesn't get out of hand. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, then Christ is here. Forgiveness is here. Blood's here. It's here for you to receive salvation. But it has to be something that you're willing to do. It can't be something that somebody forces upon you or something that somebody wants for you. It has to be something that you choose to do. We have an opportunity to do that tonight. We're ready to do that if you have a need of that. But whatever the situation is, make sure you address it. Make sure you fix it. And take control of it tonight while it's tonight because we don't know what tomorrow will be if there will even be one. As we stand and say this in the